Um, I'm trying the question and answer um, app as well. So if people are watching, they might be able to ask questions. Hopefully this works. Um, we've got zero viewers right now. But uh, anyways, <clears throat> we'll Here, see. Let me do an update on my Kickstarter real quick. Do you have a link that I can send out? Um, if you go down to the bottom right of your screen... I don't know mm -hmm. if you see it or if it's just me, but it's the Axon Survivors Enter the World of dot, 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 and there's zero viewers, and there's a thing that says links. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, dude. All right, we'll see how long I the headset lasts. So, Benjamin, do you see the links? I do not. Okay, maybe it's just me. Okay, I'll give you the event page. I'll send it to you in the chat. Hopefully, you'll get that. Yeah, I should be able to see in the chat, yeah. There we go. Mm. I didn't see it. Hold on. No. Yeah, I'm getting it in the chat. I've got it, like, there should be a group chat box on your right side of your screen, probably. Yeah. I have it. It's just, oh, wait, there it is. It just showed up. That okay. was a weird too delay. Slow. Yeah. Yeah. It's because it's coming all the way from Canada. <laughs> Could be. We, it's got to <laughs> translate. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's got to translate from Canadian, eh? Yeah. It's got to go from metric to American. Yeah, American. We have weird. We have weird measurements. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So, um, I'll get it started. <clears throat> hey, welcome to another episode of the Axel and Survivors. This is Fraser. This is Chris, and we've got very special guest uh, Benjamin. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ben Werner. Uh, Owner of Wonderworks Publishing, uh, game designer for a World of Do role-playing game. Excellent. And that's what uh, we're going to talk about, um, World of Do. And uh, Samurai, Chanbara, Samurai Noir, Kiro Kurosawa, all these kinds of awesome things. But before we begin that, you know what we have to do. Chris, what are you drinking? I have uh, one of my Innocent Gun Irish whiskeys. Oh, you lucky, lucky bastard. Indeed oh. I am. My case is depleting quickly. I cannot find it in Ottawa. I have searched. Yeah, it's hard. Check the LCBO page. Yeah. Yeah. Zero. Yeah, I think it's pretty much tapped out around here, too. So every time I drink one now, it's like, yay, and then sad. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're trapped in a bubble of emotions. That's right. A bottle of emotions, <laughs> as it were. Well, remember, Rum Finish started as a, like, um, I don't know. Limited edition. Yeah, limited edition, then they, yeah. and then they went to straight. So if Irish whiskey is, is, goes well, maybe maybe we'll see it uh, regularly. One can hope, because oh, it's, it's fabulous. One can pray. be so nice. Maybe um, I'll save one for you. That would, well, yeah, that'd be awesome. I just don't know when I'm going to be getting down. Yeah, maybe we'll get up there. To me, maybe. <laughs> So, Ben, what are you drinking? I have a rum and coke here from, uh, it's it's a, actually a high-quality uh, rum and coke here, if you can't see it. It's my Harkins movie cup. It's mostly, uh, <laughs> actually, I, it's, a, it's not coke. It's actually Diet Dr. Pepper. So, in my high-quality movie cup, it's mostly Dr. Pepper at the moment, but it's really tasty rum. It's, you're going to, this is going to sound silly, but it's actually from Costco. Um, <laughs> okay. It's off brand. It's Costco brand, Kirkland brand, and it's really? actually uh, yeah, th all their Kirkland brand uh, alcohols that they sell are all um, like really high quality uh, stuff, just without the label. So this is oh. uh, Captain Morgan. I'm drinking. That's just not labeled. That's cool. Yeah, we bottle. don't have uh, our Costco doesn't sell alcohol. Ah, oh, but you do. It does sell uh, poutine, and that's really really yummy. <laughs> Except, well, I don't know. Yeah, our poutine. The, the the fries are good. I love the Costco fries and cheese is cheese. It's uh, like the curds. Mm -hmm. But the Costco we have, it's this kind of weird orange gravy. It's not a beef oh. gravy. It's not chicken gravy. I don't know what it is. Ew. See, I've only had poutine um, from the Costco in uh, Vancouver. Yeah. It actually, funny story, it was on my brother-in-law's uh, wedding day. We went and had poutine for breakfast <laughs> at a Costco nice. Nice. in our tuxes. Very nice. Need to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was actual beef gravy too. So yeah, it was better than the uh, Tim Hortons poutine that we had had the other day. 
wow, before I, that. So. I didn't know. Our uh, McDonald's here have poutine now. I don't know if all of them do, but some of them do. It's again, it's s similar to orange gravy to whatever Costco has. It's really weird. That's it's, it's bizarre. That's too bad. Like yeah. I'm a, I enjoy the poutine. Uh, a favorite restaurant right now, or one of our favorite one, has a breakfast poutine. Oh my gosh, so that sounds good. It's fries, or actually, uh, not fries, but like, uh, uh, pot like uh, potatoes, smothered in gravy and cheese and an egg. It's fabulous. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> it's so good. Rich creamery butter. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. It is a kickstart and bacon in there. I got. I oh. bacon. It is. It is a fabulous way to kickstart your day, yeah, or would be a great kill way. your heart. Yeah. Well, yeah. Either way, you're getting a kickstart. You're getting right. something. <laughs> Something's a happening. A couple hours later, we're going to restart your heart with paddles of life. That's exactly. All exactly. Who cares? You have <laughs> we to yeah, right? there. If you're going to die, you might as well die eating that. Exactly. Why wouldn't you? I mean, it's perfectly, perfectly logical. Of course. It only makes sense. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I've got a uh, Spearhead Moroccan Brown Ale. I'm gonna open it right now. And um, Spearhead also makes a really nice Hawaiian uh, pale ale, Hawaiian style pale ale. Um, and when I saw the Moroccan Brown Ale, I thought, what the heck? Why not? Uh, they they did they did the uh, pale, the Hawaiian pale ale well. This is really good. Um, now I've generally been a fan of uh, hoppy beers. Um, India Pale Ales uh, uh, and things like that, but this is um, the IBU on this. The International Bitterness Union is only 35, but it's a really good brown ale. It's it's got a lot of character. It's um, uh, my buddy John and I had a few and we were really enjoying them. But what we decided was this is good for it's 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 got such a strong character. It's good for one or two drinks, but it's not something you're going to have on the patio like four or five or as our um, as our beer expert uh, Chris Motherfucking Bullock would say, a session mm -hmm. beer because you're gonna ah, be drinking yes. a shitload of them in a session. So this is not a session beer. This is, it, but it does have a lot of character. If you can find it in the in your in your local beer store, it's made in Toronto, Spearhead Brewing Company. Check out the the one I'm having tonight is the Moroccan Brown Ale, but also if you see their Hawaiian Pale Ale, both of them are really good. So shout out to Spearhead. Well done, gentlemen. Hmm. All right then. Uh, yeah, and that is some good shit. Now, I'm pretty damn certain it's not as good as an innocent gun, um, but uh, we we we, I, we all must bear our crosses. Yeah. Now, I, Benjamin, I forget where is it you're joining us from? Uh, Arizona. Arizona. Phoenix area. All right. So, so you technically you know, in a small town called Surprise. Do you have a uh, surprise? <laughs> do, you, exactly. do you have uh, brew, uh, beers from the Left Handed Brewing Company? Available? No, but there's um. The, oh, what's the name of the big brewer company here in Phoenix? Um, I I was just at a soccer game, um, and they have a Four Peaks. Four Peaks okay. is the big brewing company here. That's like the local, uh, like um, what's the term? Like I'm forgetting a, the term. Like a local brewery, like a right, like um, not, yeah. craft. They're brewery? not like a big. They're oh. not like a you know Coors right, or like, anything. Yeah, craft brewery basically. Thank you. That's the word. Yeah. Yeah, I forget. Yeah, it's just the only reason I'm asking because anytime I go stateside and I've like close to our borders around here, like Detroit and uh, Buffalo and stuff. But then I've also had it. I was in Nashville where it actually was introduced to it. Um, but it's a left-handed brewing company, and it's a nitro milk stout. If you like stouts, it's miraculous. It is so good. So yeah, yeah, milk stout. There it is. Cool. Mm hmm. I'm left-handed. I should probably try it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That looks um, cool. Well, I, I want to get into this because uh, uh, got a lot to talk about because it's one of my favorite subjects, and 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 I'm I'm hoping this is going to be one of my favorite games. Uh, we are going to be talking about the the Kickstarter, Ben's Kickstarter for a World of Do. Um, and I don't want to uh, steal your thunder, Ben. So how about just give us the elevator pitch for World of Dew? All right. Uh, World of Dew is a samurai noir role-playing game. It's a sequel to John Wick's Blood and Honor role-playing game that came out in 2010. You play characters from your favorite Shambara-style uh, films in a story-driven city. Very cool. The title, of the, the title of the game comes from a famous haiku by the poet Isa. So... 
And so anybody that knows me or has been listening to this podcast, as soon as I read Samurai Noir, they knew my money was going there. <laughs> <laughs> and and to and to seal the deal, just the uh, uh, I think second or third paragraph is uh, talks about uh, ex- to experience all the characters you'd find in a Kira Kurosawa movie. So there you go, boom. Now I have not uh, played uh, Blood and Honor, and I'm not very familiar with it. So why don't you give us the a, a very quick rundown of how mechanics work in Blood and Honor? Okay. So the mechanics for A World of Dew are very, very similar to Blood and Honor. We've changed a couple small but significant things. Um, the uh, history, or I should say bloodline, the lineage of Blood and Honor, comes from a, another game John wrote um, previously, I think 2005, called Houses of the Blooded. And Houses of the Blooded uses a, sim- a system that is basically a cousin to Fate. Before Fate Court came out, um, Spirit of the Century was the big game that uh, Fate did, Evil Hat. Uh, had yep. going, and uh, from that, John borrowed aspects and a lot of uh, character ideas. So uh, the basic of the game is you have, um, there are six virtues in the game, um, which are like your major stats, sort of your attributes. Um, there's, um, I'm going to forget all of them now. Uh, <laughs> I'm alive. Uh, there's beauty, uh, courage, uh, wisdom, cunning, prowess, and strength. Haha, got all six. Um well Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, when you make your character, you get to have five of them. The sixth one is your weakness, so it makes a uh, major character flaw, just like in noir films. And then you have aspects, just like you would in a fake game, that describe your character in descriptive ways um, that are also can be used kind of like skills. And then you have a geary, which is kind of like a job or maybe a character class, um, which would be like a geisha or yakuza, police inspector, sumo wrestler, those sort of things like that, and they give you other bonuses and also work themselves as aspects. And basically the way the system works mechanically with dice is that whenever you take a risk when something's important that you need to figure out um, how the story's going to go, you collect uh, six-sided dice equal to your uh, your appropriate uh, aspects as well as your appropriate virtues and your geary and anything that's appropriate to it. And then you roll either by yourself versus a target number of ten and um, or you roll against someone else if someone else is rolling against you. And whoever gets a higher gains privilege. If you lose, uh, if you make the 10 but you lose, you gain half. Oh, something I forgot to mention. Uh, it's very easy to beat a 10. Um, and also, if there's two of you with lots of dice, you can put dice aside called wagers. And uh, wagers give you um, a- abilities to say more about what uh, happens when you roll the dice. So if you roll the dice and win, you get to keep all your wagers. And each uh, wager is a yes and statement that you add to what happens. So when you gain privilege, when you roll and you've, you've won privilege, then you get to uh, describe the action of what happened, whether you succeed or fail. It, it's not necessarily that you roll dice and win and you automatically succeed. You could actually fail forward story-wise by saying, okay, I'm running across the rooftops and I'm going to try to jump from this roof to the next roof. It's really far. You roll the dice, you succeed. And with your privilege, you say, oh, well, I missed the roof, and I land, uh, I missed the roof, and I'm falling. And then you spend your first wager and say, I land on this balcony, and the door's open, and someone's inside. And then you, and then you could say, like, and it's my enemy, and he has a sword, and we duel. And then you could go from there. So, and that would be, like, the next bit. So that's basically a quick overview of how the entire system works. Very cool. Um, and so... Do, do, on the page, when you talk about Blood and Honor, you're talking about uh, uh, samurais. But World of Dew right. is more about Ronin and other other characters. Um, right. So, can you also uh, play samurai, or is it is it um, very focused on the the people outside, like the outsiders or the um, the untouchables? Yes, and yes. Um, so mechanically. Um, you can uh, Blood and Honor was written so that it would focus on clan samurai, basically during like the Sengoku Jidai, which is the age of the country at war when like Japan was unifying, um, and when the to- when Tokugawa won. It's all during the time of, like Oda Nobunaga and all those different guys like that, um, and they um, so that it, that's the whole story about uh, playing in Blood and Honor is you have a clan that you create first, and then you build a bunch of samurai that are all members of that clan, and you play as those characters. Um, in A World of Dew, 
you can actually bring those rules in, like you could, say, if you were playing a vampire game in World of Darkness and you wanted to bring in werewolf characters from a werewolf game, the system works together like that. So you could do that. But World of Dew specifically focuses on everyone bought the samurai. Now, there are there is a status in the game, which is a new mechanic, um, where you can be of samurai status, like the police inspector is technically of samurai status. But he, he doesn't have like the same backing of like a clan that he would if he if you were playing like Blood and Honor. Right. So he's just a lone guy, a police inspector. He's got the police department that helps him, but that's it. So and it's it's interesting because uh, again the the reference to Akira Kurosawa most of his well his movies in the in the 60s and 50s uh, the the Chanbur movies there the even though like Seven Samurai they're not actually samurai they're closer to right. Ronin because they don't have right. a lord right exactly they're yeah they're Seven Ronin if you really want to you know get technical on it I mean the thing is is like the word samurai means something different to American or English speakers than it does to the Japanese samurai to, in Japan is more of like a social caste right they're like like the best way to describe it would be like nobility mm-hmm. so there are samurai women who never pick up a sword or samurai boys and girls that you know have never fought a day in their life but they're all related in the nobility you know they're not they're not royals you know they're not the imperial family but they're they're nobles so in like that would probably be actually the better term, but we we everyone in the U.S. and Canada and the yeah. English world calls them samurai. Yeah. And really, what we when we say samurai, what we really probably mean more correct normally is like bushi, which is like warrior. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But That's yes, you're right. It's totally Ronin. Which is good. So. Again, like I mean, to be honest, I don't think I would want. I'm not really interested in playing the samurai. I'm not really interested in in the the character that has. I'm interested in characters that have restraints on them, but not the restraint of, of like a samurai. I, I mean, again, one of one of the one of the best part, not the best, but one of the interesting parts of Seven Samurai is where um, he, we first meet the leader of the samurais. Uh, or the Ronin again, and he he uh, saves the the children by shaving his top knot, right? And and going in as a monk, but I mean, it, that he's not be he's not restrained by his ties to a lord or anything, and he's actually not really resta- restrained by the cultural norms that he generally follows, but he he's restrained by a much higher code of honor, and that that follows all the way through the movie, and that's what makes him such amazing characters, which is again. Yes. One of the reasons why uh, reading the description of World of Dew, it, why I was intrigued and, and certainly why I backed it, because that's the, those are the kind of things that I want to play. Yeah, that, exactly. And actually, that's that's why I wrote this game is because John wrote, he started writing Blood and Honor. He's like, I'm going to go and write a samurai role playing game. And I'm like, woohoo! You've already done it in the past, but you're making a new one with like <laughs> new game mechanic like concepts, right? Like aspects and all these other things about telling stories versus like we're going to have a small miniature combat, which, you know, on the table with, you know, grid paper and stuff, which can be fun in its own way, but I also want to do the storytelling stuff too. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was really excited. And then he's like, and it's all going to be about your clan and Sengoku Jidai. And I'm like, ah, crap. (laughs) Because every role-playing game seems to focus, that's about Japan, seems to focus on the samurai. And I get it. They're really popular. It's huge. But I wanted to play a game where you get to play everyone else. And so that's why I started going towards this. Plus, my favorite time period in Japan is actually the Tokugawa era and the Meiji Restoration. So all that stuff with, like, the interaction with the uh, all the gaijin coming in and messing around with Japan and how, that, how the Japanese reacted to that and all those different cool things like that. I mean, one of the things I put in the, in the game specifically is Blood and Honor had an honor mechanic, which is kind of like style points, if you're aware of you know how those work, or... Mm-hmm. Um, Stuff like you know where it's like you can spend. There are mechanic that you can. There are points that you spend to like be more awesome. Well, and you get it by being honorable. But it's in uh, Blood Honor and in uh, World of Do. It's a uh, it's a collective mechanic. So it's a pool that everyone has access to. So if anyone is honorable in the group, they can get an extra point for the entire pool for the entire group. And um, but then I introduced a new mechanic in the game in this game because I wanted something that would like bring it down into the noir grittiness, and that's ninjo or desire in English. And it basically is anytime you do something, you write down a desire on your character sheet specifically that's something your character wants to accomplish. 
right? So if you're like really poor and you're, you know, destitute and you have no money or anything, then maybe, you know, have a hot meal is, you know, your desire. Or it's, you know, overthrow the Tokugawa if you're more powerful. And every time you make a step towards fulfilling your desire, you get a ninja point. And then you can spend ninja points by being cool, but the, when you spend them, you can only help yourself. You can't help anyone else. Oh, so, okay. That's cool. So these two uh, different <clears throat> things war with each other. And ninja points are personal. So you can get ninja points a lot easier. But um, And then all the players who aren't samurai status get two ninja points and one honor point. And all the samurai get two honor points and one ninja point. And really, there aren't that many samurai characters in the game, except for actually the Yakuza have a special deal where they view honor differently. So they get two points of honor, one point of ninja, but their honor is the, the honor of the Yakuza, which is works differently. It's protecting your neighborhood sort of thing. <laughs> Loosening your pinky finger and things like that. Right. No, yeah, exactly. It is. It's, <laughs> it's Yakuza honor, which is different. So, yeah. Now, um, what, one of the things you, you mentioned in... Uh, in in an email was that you'd recently watched the uh, um, Thirteen Assassins. Mm-hmm. The and that's an interesting um, and it, obviously it didn't have a, an impact on your game design because you watched it after you designed the game. But it's interesting that movie versus uh, 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 Kurosawa because in Kurosawa there's so much story interlaced with uh, spikes of violence. Right. And then with 13 Assassins, you've got so much story, and then you've just got a shitload of violence. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I'm no. Wa- Go ahead. I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering how... I mean, it, in, in our discussion right now, it's, it's become very clear to me how I could very easily replicate a, a Kurosawa movie with this game. I'm interested also in how easily would I be able to replicate 13 Assassins. Oh, it would actually be really easy, because in the game... Um, there's uh, three different types of violence in the game. There's uh, strike, which is literally you and I are sitting across from each other in character, talking to each other, and my character doesn't like something you say, your character says. So I literally point at you and say strike, and what that is is I've drawn my weapon and I've attacked you. And we both collect our dice and roll immediately. No one else can get involved. Um, And then when we're done, one or both of us or neither of us might be dead. Most likely one of us will be dead. When, in that sort of situation because it's pretty deadly. Um, and then if we want to keep fighting, then it becomes what's called a mass comp or uh, mass murder. It's basically everyone who wants to get involved rolls dice, and then you basically take turns spending your wagers pointing at different people that you're going to cut down. So it becomes very quickly a big game of everyone's dying. <laughs> uh, which works perfectly for 13 Assassins. Yes. Because, and, and then there's actually another uh, rule that we have as well, which is, um, which is like, it seems like it was tailor-made for 13 Assassins. It's called the Yawamushi rule, which is any unnamed NPC, um, if you have uh, three ranks or higher in a sword school, and if you're a good you know, fighter, like you were one of the 13 Assassins would be, um, then you can uh, point at any un- unnamed NPC and just be like, I kill them. So, <laughs> that's very much like thirteen assassins. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, you know, if if you're playing one of those assassins and you're got like thirty guys running at you, like you do in thirteen assassins, like for the last hour of the movie, you just are like, <laughs> I kill that guy, I kill that guy, I kill that guy, I kill that guy, you know. So, awesome. Yeah. But another aspect, just as you were talking about the three different kinds of combat, another aspect of of the Chandra movies. Um, that it, it, I'm not sure if it's a carryover from westerns or if it influenced westerns or not, but the stare down, um, mm. like the end of Sanjuro, where Toshiro Mifune's character um, is is facing down against the, or is it the end of Yojimbo? No, it's, I'm pretty sure it's the end of Sanjuro. Anyways, I think it's they're Sanjuro. staring down, and there's like ten minutes of them just staring at each other, <laughs> and then finally they draw, and uh, of course Toshiro Mifune wins. But right. Of course. Is is there any kind of um, mechanic, or is there a way of use of doing that in World of Doom? How would it look? Um, there is actually. Uh, it's called the duel. It's the third type of violence, and I should actually get to that page in my book so I can tell you correctly. Because <laughs> I always have this fear of when telling people rules that I'm going to like be slightly wrong. Um, I did an update where I actually accidentally copied an old beta copy of the Yakuza character, and a guy actually called it, and he's like, hey, there's this issue here. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I feel terrible. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Right? Um, 
No, so uh, the third type is a duel, and you basically, you and the other character um, um, are going to have a duel, so you start collecting your dice for your different things um, that you have available, and then um, one of you, I think the person with the most dice, let me look at this really quickly, um, yeah, the person with the most dice, um, both of you gather all your dice together, and then you announce your dice total, so let's say, Fraser, you have like 12 dice, and Chris has six dice. So one of you can then set aside a number of wagers. Um, the second player has to set aside the equal number of wagers. Then you both roll. Whoever has the highest gains privilege. If um, you can't, uh, if you don't beat a ten, you lose all your wagers. You you get nothing. Okay. Um, the person with the privilege, the person who wins the roll, um, then narrates the outcome of the duel. They can say something like, "My opponent dies," or "I die," or "We tie," or anything like that. And then you can gain glory from it. So you, um, depending on the number of dice wagered, is how much glory you get. So in our previous example with Chris and Fraser, uh, uh, Fraser could literally wager six of his dice, and Chris would have no dice. Right. If if he did that, then there would be uh, there would be no glory gained from it because you only gain how much glory your opponent wagered. Oh, so, okay. So uh-huh. it actually gives a motivation for you to, uh, you know, do a little bit more. Like to offer, like to not force to, them to out, keep it, to not to overbid. Keep it even, basically. Like, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, and then you can also, I mean, and you can, there's a number of different things you can do with it. Um, you can actually, before you strike, or you both roll your dice, and you can actually, the winner can actually say, we tie, and no one drew their swords. We just looked at each other, you know. You can describe the, the, the exact stare down from Sandro and <clears> be like, or, or actually, even um, I'm not. I'm thinking of Sandra. I'm thinking of the Seven Samurai when the two guys are staring each other down. Yeah. And when he's collecting the samurai, and the one guy says, "You lost," and then the guy gets angry and strikes yep. anyways. <laughs> and then <dies. laughs> you, Actually, what's what's very interesting is, is we're talking about this. I also realize that the 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 mechanics, not the not the dressing of it, but the mechanics themselves would also work very well for westerns because that that scene is totally mimicked in uh, Magnificent Seven. Well, I mean, the entire yep. movie is, but yeah, it, right. It's kind well, of interesting. That, Sorry, that, that scene's mimicked in every western, like any yeah, yeah. pretty much every <laughs> western. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it is interesting. Both the um, the cross pollination of westerns and Chambara. I mean, could also be done mechanically with the game. That, that's neither here nor there. It's just kind of in- interesting. Yes, um, well, uh, there there is a small project that I have sitting on the side. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you for bringing that point up. <laughs> Some day in the future, there will be a, a role-playing game using similar mechanics, hopefully for Westerns. So. Sweet. Well, yeah. I mean, based on the success of the World of Do Kickstarter right now, and we're calling it a success because you had a goal of two thousand dollars, and you're already right. almost at fifteen thousand. So, oh man, you, I, was so, I was so I was so bummed. We were so close. I was hoping that when we started the podcast, I would be able to say we broke fifteen thousand today. Wow! And then a really nice guy had to actually back out from his pledge because he had uh, car trouble, and he sent me a really nice long message apologizing. I'm like, dude, it's your money, your car, but you know, oh well. Stuff happens, so, yeah. You know, like probably I, by the time that this actually drops, it'll probably be a day or two. I mean, you'll you'll probably have cracked fifteen. We probably, yeah. We're fourteen seven eighty six at at this very moment. So yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. So uh, then in the future, we will soon see a Kickstarter for a um, Western based on these yeah. rules, which would be cool. That would. Yeah. We don't have enough Western games. Well, we don't. We don't. In fact, I love. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say we absolutely don't have enough good Western games. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, Aces and Eights for the um, the life track stuff, where you're going through and like you 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 improve as a character based on what you're trying to do, like what your character is. So like, if you're a card dealer, then you improve based on uh, you know all the different things you do with you know dealing cards and stuff like that, getting your own you know place to deal cards and. You know, ha- having people do different things and whatnot, and I th- and like if you're a miner, you get money or you get experience points based on what you do as a miner. Yeah, I and, think, not, and not just generically, like in big like big steps sort of thing. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I, I was gonna say, and I think that's really good for the the type of western that they tried to model, which is much more of a simulation. Right. 
less so the cinema uh, cinem <laughs> cinemographic cinemographic that, yeah cinemographic still doesn't sound right to me right at the moment but anyways to that to that style of western uh, right like they've tried to other games have tried to do it but they still come off very straight laced and yeah. a, a noir engine really is much closer to what those movies were doing yeah because they're so all of the yeah no, so hopefully, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, cool. so hopefully, so hopefully, I somehow kick my long writing schedule and you know can get this out in a year or two. Now, so. now, would you have it? How mechanically are the games related? Like, could you use your samurai from this and drop them into that? Probably not. Um, the big thing is like, I mean, all the Gary that I wrote for World of Do are completely new. I mean, okay. the basic, the Blood and Honor. It's basically the mechanical frame that I hung everything on. And then I even changed a couple things. Like one of the big differences is how season action works, which is basically your experience in the game. Um, you get season actions based on, um, in Blood and Honor, based on your daimyo. He actually grants season actions to different people. I think you get like one for yourself. And then everything else is shared amongst the clan because you're in a clan. So is that like, um, bur like the burning wheel concept or... Um, it's something John came up with for Houses of the Blooded. Okay. And basically what it is is that as time passes, you get things to improve or change yourself. Um, so with season actions, you can like spend them to increase your um, increase like your rank in a sword school. Or in Houses of the Blooded, for example, you would do it by – you would be able to build new holdings or new buildings. And in fact, in Blood and Honor, the clan can build new holdings and buildings by spending season actions. In my game – we actually, uh, season actions are specifically only for personal improvement. And uh, the buildings in the locations in the city that you're playing in are actually improved or increased by you spending honor or ninja points at them to <laughs> activate the effects in the buildings that are there for the different types. Interesting. Very interesting. That sounds really cool. Yeah. It, which so, actually brings me, because part of uh, World of Dew is is about the, the city, right? Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. Uh, how does that interact with the with the characters? Okay, so the city concept um, has an interesting lineage as well. Um, when I first started working on this um, is when uh, Dresden Files first dropped, and I really I'm a huge Dresden Files fan. I've read all the books. In fact, I just got a notice today that my signed copy is coming. My wife is a big fan too. So, and Jim Butcher is going to be at Gen Con, and so I'm. I squealed like a fangirl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways, um, long story short, they have a really cool city construction system where you're playing characters in like the Dresden Files universe, and one of the big things in the Dresden Files is Chicago. And Dresden Files is a noir uh, role-playing game. It's their, it's their take on like magical noir. Right. And uh, the city interacts with the players in that they build threats and faces and, and locations that... like. And basically the way they do it is that everything is an aspect. So you could build a location and it's an aspect. So if it helps you or hinders you in a role, then that's you activate the aspect in that manner. Um, in mine, it was a little bit different um, because the House of the Blood of Background where, and in Blood and Honor where locations have like in-game effects. Um, in Blood and Honor, or not Blood and Honor, in World of Dew, let me back up, in Houses of the Blooded, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the... Uh, Buildings are mostly like things for like acquiring resources because they're actually more like forests or, or or gold mines or things like that. They're more like standard fantasy trope type locations. Um, in the Blood and Honor, uh, the locations are like things you would have for your clan, like a garrison or maybe even a geisha house or things like that. And they have little effects that they do that help you with your story. So when I wrote um, a World of Dew. What I wanted to do was build a city, and I wanted to have buildings and locations that you would find in a city that would be appropriate for driving the type of story you want to have. So, for example, um, you have, like, um, the Geisha House, and in that, you can go there, and if you spend an honor point, you basically describe how you're spending time with Geisha, and they are giving you rumors. Maybe they're talking to you. And they tell you different things about what's, what's been going on, or you overhear things from them. Um, and then you have things like the magistrate's court, which is like where police, the police are. And what you can do with those is 
you can get rumors, uh, you, or you take rumors that you say you've gotten from like the Geisha house or from a couple of the different uh, locations that also provide rumors, and you can spend them there and you can uh, change them from rumors into leads. So if you're a police inspector and trying to figure out a, a case because you are a police inspector, then you can change, you can spend the rumor and it becomes a number of leads based on the rank of the magistrate's court. And uh, so it might be like, oh, this rumor was that this woman, you know, was involved with this murder. And then you find out that the woman was staying at this uh, tavern at this location and she was fighting with this other person. So you can go find out about that. So it gives you a lead on solving your crime. So that's like sort of an example of two of the locations and what they do in the game. Cool. Very so. nice. Yeah, I mean, like, there's also a couple of things like uh, the surgery or apothecary. You can go there and, like, get poisons or you can, like, heal. Heal not in, like, the traditional sense, but that you can, uh, your wounds, the wounds work differently in, in World of Do in that you're either just, like, taking a whole bunch of, like, minor wounds and you're, you know, you're still chugging along like you would in a Chambara film or you've taken a major one and you're dead or you're close to death. And so with those, it basically makes sure that you're not going to, like, get sick from your wounds and then it starts a slow process of healing. So, and then, like, another, I want to share this too, with you. There's two other locations I really like that I wrote for the ga uh, game. One of them is the gang hideout, which is actually you choose another location in your city, and you lay it on top of that uh, location. <laughs> and that location is always a rank one, but secretly the gang hideout is in the back room of that location. <laughs> so, and then that gives you all the bonuses for what a gang hideout does, which is allows you to commit crimes, and you can go to the gang hideout and ask that Oyoban if he'll commit crimes on your behalf, and then you spend points and they'll commit the crime for you. Um, um, you get all these bonus points for rolling the die to make sure a crime happens. You get to describe what happens with crime, but now you owe a number of favors equal to the uh, Yakuza hideout, gang hideout, to the Oyoban. So now you have to do something for the, the Oyoban now that he's done something for you. And they're always happy to do things for you. Of course, they are. <laughs> of course they are. And then my final, my other one that I really like a lot is the sumo school, where you can go and you can like become strong. You can get like wagers for like strength risks, or you can be a sumo and train there, and then you can increase your sumo school ranks. But then the other, the other thing that I really like about it that's something I came up with, which is whenever you build a sumo school in a city, you have to build a second sumo school, and it is the rival of the sumo school you built, and you have to describe it. <laughs> so, yeah. Very cool. Um, I want I want to uh, talk about the the stretch goals, but before I do that, there was one other um, part of the description that really pulled me in because I'm also a huge fan of the novel Shogun and mm. and the miniseries. And you yes. actually mentioned the um, dastardly or the, uh, the the Spanish merchant, mm -hmm. which uh, totally boom. As soon as I read that, I'm like, oh wait, then we get again Tokugawa era. Um, Shogun. Oh, you could totally do Shogun in this as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm a huge fan of Shogun. I've I've read that novel. I think I've read all of James Clavell's novels a couple times. I uh, may have LARPed a, a version of uh, one of the uh, Strawn. I think it's Strawn. Is that their last name? Uh, the characters from the Taipan novels. Oh, in a yeah, vampire yeah. LARP. Yeah. So I may I, I may have LARPed that at one point in my life. Um, one of those characters with a resources six, I think. So, anyways, uh, geek moment aside. Yeah, so you can totally <laughs> play that. Uh, Gaijin are characters that you can uh, choose in the game. Um, you choose your Geary, whatever a job is appropriate. So, like, you can be a doctor, and you would be a Western-trained doctor if you want to be a, a Gaijin. And then you choose the country you come from, and then your honor is based, or your honor, your status, your Gaijin status is based on the patron that you have that for where you're at. So that's kind of what... Uh, that's kind of how the Gaijin work. Uh, their honor, obviously, is different. They get more ninja than they, they do uh, honor. Mm -hmm. And um, then you, you treat them like that. So Gaijin it becomes like basically an aspect that they have on their character sheet. So, But there's also Geary for like priests or holy people. So yeah. you can be a, a Jesuit if you want, or a Protestant you know, Dutch firebrand, or a Buddhist nun, or Shinto priest, or whatever you want for those so yeah, and actually one of the locations in the game is is a church. So you can actually have churches and they do things in the game. Fantastic. So, yeah. So I mean basically this game is 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 hitting all of the high points for me. I mean <laughs> <laughs> the only thing it's missing is is the scene where the Korean Navy sinks the Japanese Navy. But that's neither here nor there. 
Well, there is a guy writing a smuggler stretch goal, and he's going to write about ships a little bit. So um, maybe if, if, <laughs> if you can get a word in with him, uh, <laughs> he might put in enough uh, stuff about ships to do that. Perfect. But I think what we need to talk about uh, is the sound of water, because uh, this is turning yes. out to be something that's... I don't know if it, if it is going to um, be bigger than the actual uh, game book itself, but it's, it's growing in size as we speak. Um, what is The Sound of Water? So The Sound of Water is the companion piece. Um, I wanted... A, um, the one thing I knew that I could do if I went over my original goal uh, was that I, I had a bunch of friends that are all writers, and I have a bunch of friends who are all artists who would be willing to you know, write for this game. You have a, they're all like, oh yeah, this totally sounds like a cool thing. And um, so what I wanted to do was have them all write on like an area um, and create art in an area about this sort of setting that would interest them. So basically we set it up and I got everyone lined up um, and then we launched the Kickstarter and then it kicked in less than three hours. And so I quickly scrambled and had them all start sending me their bios and their uh, photos so that we could put them up on the page because uh, I was like, oh, yeah, get it to me sometime this week. <laughs> and we launched and we kicked. <laughs> and we, the very first day, I actually had my, we hit our first uh, first two stretch goals, so which was pretty crazy. So I had to get my very first bios up there on the on the thing. Yeah, so, yeah it went the, really fast, yeah. Yeah, if we hit $20,000, uh, which is our second to last stretch goal, then that will be the entire... Sound of Water, the book, the companion book. Um, the the other big thing that I planned for was, because I've seen this happen to before, and I've had this happen to me when I've backed Kickstarters, is that when people like start adding content to their book, it delays its release. And I really want this book out before Gen Con. Yep. It looks like we're going to be able to have it out and mailed out, knock on wood. Um, th that mostly depends upon the printer right now. Um, and if the rest of us can hit our like the editing time, you know, Deadlines yep. and stuff like that. Um, but the um, the book I wanted it to be separate because I first off I didn't want to force all my writers to like write under the gun really quickly because <laughs> they're all my friends. And the same with the artists, I didn't want them to all paint, you know, draw and paint and whatnot under the gun either because you want them to be able to you know do create what they're going to create. So they're all they all have a, a deadline around uh, the end of August after Gen Con, and everyone's writing somewhere between two and three thousand words. Mm -hmm. um, so if we get our, let's see, how many do we have? One, two, so yeah, we have uh, six authors and artists, so that's um, about 18,000 words for that. And then if the Fate gets unlocked, Ryan Macklin's doing a full conversion for Fate, which is great because they're actually cousins. Right. Um, and uh, he's going to do somewhere, <laughs> I think, between ten and 15,000 words. So it'll probably wow. come in, clock in, it will it will definitely clock in under a world of dew, but it's going to be a substantial book. So, yes. Yeah. So I'm I'm super excited. And just I mean just looking at some of the topics that are already unlocked, like uh, supernatural horror, hor sorry, supernatural horror, um, mm -hmm. proto yakuza in the Boshin War, <laughs> think yep. American Minutemen. Yeah. And then we've got of course the ninja. Got to yep. have that. Yeah. Geishas. Yeah, that's going to be really cool. So. And rice transporters. <laughs> yeah, smugglers, basically. Yeah. So, so I told John Kennedy that uh, when I'm making the characters for uh, with the smugglers, I want to have a Chinese smuggler named Han, and I want him <laughs> to uh, have this really fast smuggling ship that his buddy, the Portuguese uh, smuggler who's really hairy and carries a crossbow, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, pilots with him, and his his buddy's name is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because that would be awesome. Yes. And my friends have given me crap about wanting that character duo in games forever, you know. But I think it would be cool. Just saying. You now, know, if if we can draw inspiration, if 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 George Lucas can draw inspiration from the Hidden Fortress, then I think we can draw inspiration from his uh, from his work too. So. And and seriously, that opening, I when. When I had one of the things that actually got me into Kurosawa was Star Wars. When I had heard that mm -hmm. um, George Lucas had got uh, inspiration from Kurosawa, but much like you, I didn't see Hidden Fortress until after many other Kurosawa movies. But when I finally did see it, 
it was amazing that opening. I'm just like, holy shit! He literally ripped that off. Yeah, he totally did. Yeah, I actually just watched it. Uh, I was telling you before we started that I literally just watched it just a couple days ago. So it's yeah, it's really fresh in my mind. It, it was literally like the same opening. I mean, except for the fact that you know C-3PO is cussing at R2D2. Yeah. You know, R2D2 of course is cussing at C-3PO in Star Wars. You just can't understand him. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and even the fact that there's like a, um, a the tall skinny guy and, and then the shorter wider guy, you're just like, right. wow, like yeah. totally taken. Yeah. Plus the uh, giant spaceship, right well, out of that. that. Yeah. <laughs> right out of the tower. Little known fact, director. That's cut. right. The, yeah. Yes, the director's cut. And um, I was actually, I, want, I wanted to say one more thing about uh, Hidden Fortress. One of my favorite scenes in that movie is when uh, Toshiro Mufune's character, the general, has the duel with the other general. Mm -hmm. And people always talk about like duels in samurai movies being with swords, but that duel is actually with Yari, with spears. And it was a really good duel. I was like, in tra I was entranced and raptured watching it. And that's, you know, exactly the sort of, you know, I was like, yes, because... I opened up the schools and all the stuff for World of Do so that you can fight with, you know, other things besides just swords. Absolutely. And, I mean, one of the things that uh, Kurosawa did with his fight scenes was uh, to ensure that they were um, an, an extension of the character. Which, right. I mean, all good fight choreographers, that's what they do, right? But it's mm -hmm. it was really obvious. Um, and, again, my, my Seven Samurai is probably my top movie of all time, but my favorite movie to watch over and over again, because Seven Samurai is quite long. It's, oh, it's yeah. a big investment in time. Like three and a half hours or something? Yeah. Yojimbo is the one that I watch. If I want my Kurosawa fix, Yojimbo is the one that, that I like to watch. And watching that, the character, um, Toshiro Mifune's character, the, his fighting style is very much like him. Yes. It's gruff, it's direct, <laughs> and it just yes. gets shit done. Yeah. Right. There's nothing pretty about it. Nope. There's no flourishes. There's nothing, you know, fancy. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and the other thing, um, samurai movies are a little bit limited in that you basically had katana, neginata, spear, a, a limited variety of weapons. But if you look at Asian movies in general, the characters were as defined by their weapons. Like, you know, you had the big guys had like the big three ring swords and that the weapon was an extension of them, their personality as well, mm -hmm. which is always right. something that uh, it's just kind of something that comes across in movies much more easily because you're not defined by stats. This yes, is true. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned weapons because I think weapons are a very easy shorthand for how you can give your character... Um, extend your character through their their fighting style in a role playing game. Um, like yeah, when, right. When the role playing game, like it's it's really cool when a role playing game gives a characteristic to a weapon without just saying you know to go back to D and D. There's certain weapons that are just mechanically better than others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Pick those weapons because they're mechanically better because there's no reason not to. I mean, you right. might per you might personally say. I really don't care about long swords. I want to use whatever weapon, but it's a mm -hmm. sucky weapon. So you you're knowingly crippling yourself for that. Whereas if you take another game, um, and I don't know how your ears handled it, but another one that I'm familiar with would be Warhammer. Mm -hmm. Every hand weapon is the same stat. So if you want to use yep. an axe or sword or mace, use an axe or sword or mace. It makes no difference other than the visual of here's a big dude with an axe. Um, but then as you deviate from the basic weapons, even the other weapons, it's still all the base, same base damage, but they add a little bit of characteristics, but there's usually pros and cons. So you go with a dagger, it's faster, but it does a little bit less damage. You go with like a flail, and that first hit's really awesome, but then you kind of suffer after that. Um, and it's, you know, I kind of like that because it's given those weapons personality outside of just this weapon is mechanically better because there's always that trade-off. Yeah. And in uh, World of Doom, basically all the weapons are mechanically the same um, as far as uh, the weapon itself, except for like Master Forged weapons. So you can yeah. actually get uh, 
like special weapons that you've had forged by a master, and they can have like a curse or a history or background, which add bonus dice. But any weapon can do that. You, it's right. not just like swords. Um, and then specifically, the where I added a lot of flavor and make things different is that you can have different schools for weapons, and each of the schools is based off of. Um, one of the stats, one of the virtues. So if you want a style that's based on courage, then it's probably one where you're you're very daring and you take a lot of chances. Or if you want a style based off of beauty, then it's a very it's a style that's full of flourishes. It's very wuxia, sort of cool. like high jumps sort of thing. Right. And if you want a strong style, you're probably using a tetsubo and you're or like yojimbo and you're just standing there and someone runs at you and you just stab them. Yeah. You look at them, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know. So it's it's stuff like so that's that's where you know, I got the changes for the game is, cool. uh, or where I should, I should say I added a lot of the flavor is in the different, in the, in the different schools. Now somebody did ask a question and then it disappeared off this uh, app that I've got this for Q and a. Oh. Um, okay. So I don't have the name of the person, but what they asked was what uh, I'm trying to remember cause it disappeared, but uh, what camp, what campaigns uh, have you prepared for world of do? I think that's what it was about. Okay. Um, one of the cool things with World of Do, um, which is different than uh, a lot of other like standard role-playing games, but very similar to say like um, Dungeon World or Apocalypse World, is that you don't do a lot of like story prep before you play the game. So you build your characters and then you build your city, and in doing that, it generally informs the game master or the narrator, I should say, um, what where the characters want to go, and it gives pretty clear like. Oh, here, you know, this guy has this person, so let's mess with them. So whatever people, whatever the players pick, choose what's the obvious, you know, the obvious weaknesses and the obvious strengths that they want to play up and go with a story based on those things. So um, that's kind of like how you do it. And and basically what I'll do when I, when I run a game of it is um, I'll do something really simple, like um, we have the characters and one of the people has like an NPC ally or contact. I'll say so and so, you know, like let's say uh, Tashiro is in trouble, and then I have everyone make a wisdom risk. They all roll their dice. They all get wagers, and then we start going around the circle, describing what's what what's Tashiro's trouble is and what's going on. And from that, we have an entire story. And it's crazy because I've run, I don't know how many playtests now, and every single time it's always like so and so is in trouble. Let's go. And every single one is completely different. Everything from like, I ha I remember one story where I ran at Rincon where it was like their buddy was this uh, Yakuza u useless uh, guy, and it ended up being this big you know gang fight basically between Yakuza gangs and and a, a police inspector, and they all basically fought off the bad guys, the bad Yakuza. And then another one, it ended up being like the Daimyo himself. This is who this guy is, and he's got this issue where it's a very you know, careful political problem that you can't talk about in public. And they all had to, like, you know, backroom deal and lots of politics sort of stuff with, like, different people and, like, owing favors and whatnot. So, I mean, that's, like, the range that you can have between these things with just that, like, opening line. And then you go from there. So it's very much for uh, people that are comfortable with low prep uh, jamming. Right, exactly. I mean, and you can, I mean... If you're comfortable with high prep jamming, um, I mean, I I've done every, I've been playing and running games since I was 11, so 26 years, and I've done everything between high prep and super low prep. And um, the nice thing, the the biggest complaint I always had when I did super high prep games was I created all this stuff, and then my players, you know, screw it up <laughs> and they go, they take the left when they should have taken the right, you know, and it's and that's what they want to do. So okay. Um, but that's, you know, that's what happens. And so with this sort of thing, with this game, the way it's set up, you can, you know, you prep basic, maybe a bunch of NPCs, and that's all you need to prep. And my, my general rule of thumb is I write three true things about each NPC, and it can be like a physical description, like they have red hair, to something like they are, a, you know, a master of this sword school or anything in between that. And then uh, once I have that, that's all I'm going to describe about them at the moment. If people want to know more, we have them make wisdom or cunning risks, and they go forward from there, you know, getting it more, you know, descriptive in the story as far as that goes. So it helps. I mean, you can you you, you can prep some stuff, but then wherever the players are going is where you want to you want to take the story. Gotcha. 
I hope uh, Joshua Ramsey is still listening because uh, uh, he asked a very important question that really does need to be answered. Um, and I hope you can do so. The question is, what would Toshiro Mifune do? Oh, well, Toshiro Mifune would buy the game. Um, <laughs> and then... <laughs> no, uh, to, uh, the actor or the character? Um, he would be. He would play a Ronin, of course. That would be his favorite, and he'd have an awesome sword. And um, so he would take the that background and um, trying to think about what else he would do. Um, he'd probably have prowess as his highest virtue, maybe strength up there as well. He definitely wouldn't have beauty because he doesn't care about that. Um, he doesn't care about those sort of things like that. He's always like a gruff sort of man's yeah. man sort of character. So that's what I think Toshiro Mufuni would do. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> it's. It, this this game, the, the more you talk about this game, I, I'm getting really excited about it. The sad thing for me, though, um, and this is getting a little bit inside baseball, and it might be a little bit of a tough question. I'm sorry to do this to you. But okay. as a Canadian, I'm really buying that print and paying for the shipping. That's really tough. Right. Is there going to be um, any option later? So, for example, if, if this does end up on drive through whatever, Mm -hmm. Is there any thought of perhaps giving an option to those of us that bought it as a PDF, allowing us to get the print at cost or something? Um, I'm still in negotiations with DriveThru, so I can't say anything for certain. Um, but there, I do have. I'm I'm also a member of the IGDN, uh, yep. Independent Game Designers Network, which are really awesome. If anyone's watching, there, you guys are awesome. Um, and we have a number of Canadian members. In fact, some of our uh, board are Canadian, which is awesome. And I think a few have talked about uh, Canadian uh, printers. So it's very possible. I'm not going to say anything for certain, so yeah. don't quote me on this. Um, but if we, You're being quoted. Uh oh, okay. Um, <laughs> If we can do it, then yeah. I mean, if I could get a printer over in Canada or one in Europe, because holy cow, have I, I have a bunch of European backers. You know, someone that would be able to print on demand or something mm -hmm. for you guys in your country right. and then ship it to you without all the international shipping costs, that would be awesome. I would love to, for that to be able to happen. But right now, right now, the only we only have one printer and they're American. So. Gotcha. Yeah. No, understood. And this this is a problem that is pretty common across Kickstarter, and we've, we've, we've mentioned it before on this podcast, that there's a lot of projects that we really want to give more money to, but it's like, I'm having a hard time um, paying. Right. You know, like, um, I, I'm not exactly sure what, what the cost uh, world would do for the, for the book is 25 and then 15 yeah. for shipping. Yeah. Yeah, right? So, yeah, and actually it's, it's crazy because I have a couple. Uh, my first author for The Sound of Water Toby Abad is uh, from the Philippines, and he's a big gaming fan, and he has written some really cool stuff with Dark Horror stuff, so which is why I ended up choosing. He had, like, ten ideas, and they were all awesome, and I couldn't really choose until I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this one because I've seen your writing on this, and it's awesome. I want more of that. So that's why he went with that. But his friends in the Philippines are all like, holy cow, we want to back this, but it's super expensive. And, yeah, so I feel your pain. It happens. <laughs> yeah. We'll get over it. <laughs> At least we can get the PDF, and that's one of the beautiful things about this is that we can uh, put the money in for the PDF. Um, yeah. and, and it's all going to be in color. So. Yeah, it's going to be gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the artwork is amazing. I'd, the other thing I know some people have been doing recently, not to, I, I don't know, I should say it or not, but backing at a PDF level and then just printing it themselves. You're not going to get as nicely done a copy necessarily, but... It is an option. Yeah, I will not say I will not confirm or deny that I have ever done that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, I mean it's not like it's a big secret in this day and age that you can do yeah. it. Right. I hate, I hate to bring it up, you know, to take away sales, but you know, for for our American friends that can get the print for twenty five bucks, it's a steal. I mean, there's no yeah, exactly. In, there's no point in getting the PDF and then outsourcing your own printing because. Right. It gets expensive, whereas I mean, in Canada, we're talking. It's now a there's a fifteen dollars surcharge essentially. <laughs> right. No. It's not, yeah. You know. Um, to, yeah. to be honest, though, I mean, like, it's still I, not bad, really. No, it's not. And and honestly, uh, um, while I would like the print book, and and hopefully in the future I'll be able to get it, I'm 
since I've got the tablet, I've been ha very, very happy with PDF. My my PDF. I before I had a tablet, I could never understand the the purpose of PDFs because I never used right. them. Yeah. But with a tablet, it is very. I mean, very similar to having the book. And I'm just old enough. Um, you know, I I do remember the dinosaurs. They were very nice animals and <laughs> sad. They they all went away. But and you called them your friends. I, I did until they chewed on my leg. But yeah. um. So I, I like having the physical copy. I like having the book. Um, I find it easier, you know, to page through and stuff like that. Yeah. But I'm totally cool with having a PDF. So again, like having the ten dollar PDF option where you're getting um, the cool. the supplement as well. Uh, for me, that's that totally works. And just again, reading the description, I'm just very happy that this game is going to exist, and Thanks. it's really awesome. How successful it's been! Oh my gosh, there's a ton of people out there that feel the same way. Right, I know. I mean, Mark Diaz Truman is my uh, project manager for this. He's awesome. Thank you, Mark. Yes, he is. We love Mark Diaz Truman over here. He is a very cool dude, and he's helped me a whole bunch. And when we were doing the, um, not the schedule. What's the word? Um, the budget for mm -hmm. this game. We were like, okay, on the outside. There's a, you know, we may hit 10,000, you know, when we were doing our initial budget. We, we did projections up pretty high, but we were like, you know, if we're going to be really honest with ourselves, we'll hit maybe 6,000, you know. And I think we hit 6,000 in our second or third day. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, okay, it's a lot more popular than we thought it was going to be. So, woohoo. You know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, because this is, okay, to be totally upfront, this is my very first time writing my own role-playing game completely. I've written some minor stuff for other people, but this is my own, you know. So, but I have a lot of help from John Wick, who is, you know, pretty well-known name yeah. in the industry, and building what, off that. What do you think, just, like... Just, just very quickly, before we answer this question, we have to turn on our um, videos okay. for Wayne Humfleet, who says, how can you guys never show your faces? Are you hideous or something? Yes. This is why. <laughs> it's, this it's is a, why. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's a why bandwidth. I don't have my video. It's a can, bandwidth can, issue. Can Wayne see my, my video? Yep. Okay. Hi, Wayne. Why is mine not coming on? Yeah. on. Um, and uh, I'm actually on my second beer. It's a uh, collective arts rhyme and reason. See, if I if I had remembered... Oh, very nice. If I had remembered, I would have uh, brought up more drinks with me. But my cider is downstairs, and my drambuie is in the closet, so it's too far away for me to run. It's all good. Yeah. Oh, oh and I, my shirt. Yeah, very nice. Very good. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Canada. Is, is my camera coming on? Cause I'm no, it's not, it. dude. Yeah, it's weird. It shows that it's on, and I have my little camera light that's saying it's recording is on, but I'm not seeing my image. Yeah, well. Hmm. Hi, yeah, Wayne. It's just you and a bunch of crosses. Wayne says hi. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the picture is actually freakishly accurate to the real me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Complete with scowl. <laughs> the sneer. The resting scowl face. Yeah, pretty much. I'm going back to my scowl and picture because that looks much better. Yeah, That's mostly. Very, I, you know what? I, I was going to ask you. I, I was pretty sure that that was Scotland. Yeah. So you can tell by the weather. Yeah. yeah, that's Eileen Donan Castle where they filmed um, Highlander. Ah, oh, of course. Oh, cool. Nice. Visited a couple of times. The, that that picture was taken by my wife in 2005. Oh, you, nice. you were, I heard this is a rumor, you were actually the model for the Kurgan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It could be a, I, I've, I've never been as cool as Clancy Brown. So, I didn't have to say no. <laughs> so oh, just. Oh, wait. I'm thinking of a different Kurgan. Never mind. Krogan, not Kurgan. <laughs> Anyways. Yes. Uh, speaking of Mass Effect, uh, because I misheard you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Tony Parker is doing the art for the next stretch goal, which is awesome. Um, I've known wow. Tony for a number of years, and we've played a number of role-playing games together. And he is super awesome, cool. He's a really, really nice guy. And everyone is, actually, that's doing stretch goals for me. They're all super nice. But it's kind of crazy weird, you know. This guy you've known for you know years and years, and he's like, uh, you know, uh, doing the comic for Mass Effect, and he cool. he actually just finished it, which is actually kind of cool. The Kickstarter actually we delayed it. Um, I was going to start at the beginning of February, but then I got really sick for a couple months, um, like almost two months, and then I'm totally fine now. But um, 
It turns Dude, out you were just bored. I was just bored. <laughs> yeah, it's just bored. Co- I was just coughing up boredness. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, no, but it actually worked out perfect because Tony was super busy with finishing up Mass Effect, and he's like, I really want to help you with your game. I really want to do one of the stretch goals, but I don't know if I'm going to have time because I'm working on Mass Effect. And then, and then literally, like, I was better, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to start my uh, stretch goal. And he's like, or start my Kickstarter up. And Tony's like, well, hey, I just finished Mass Effect. So, yeah, it's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm super psyched that he and everyone else is working on it. So it's cool. Yeah, you've assembled quite a team. And, again, if people go to the Kickstarter page, which we will have a link in the documents, there's little bios for all of the um, stretch goal participants. Yeah. It's very cool. And I think I, most of them I, I've met actually like in real life. There, a couple of them were like online friends. So like um, Steve Radabaugh and John Kennedy and um, Bree, they're all uh, um, IGDN people. So I, I haven't actually met them in person. But everyone else we've all met. I actually roomed with Stan at a RinCon I think one year. And... Uh, Fabian Badia is actually one of the first artists. He's actually running an L5R game for us right now. Our last session is going to be in two weeks, I think. So we just this Saturday played the second to last session of the game of a long campaign. So I was playing a berserker poet. Uh, nice. crab. <laughs> so he was pretty, he's pretty awesome actually. So yeah, it's super fun. Excellent. Yeah. But again, a clan samurai, not, not a Ronin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the the Ronin are just that much more fun to play. And just because uh, Rob Wakefield I- isn't here, but might listen to this at some time, um, the Ronin is much more fun to play. Yes, the Ronin. Yes, <laughs> that, that you, Rob is correct. <laughs> no, correct. <laughs> no, Rob hates it when I say Ronin. Oh, uh, oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Rob. Drive him nuts. Because yeah. we can't correctly uh, enunciate the foreign word. No, no, yeah. It's English. Our we English tongues everything. are not designed to handle that sort of complexity. No, they're not. No, no, they're not. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Benjamin, for uh, oh. for spending the time with us. Just before um, we, we end this, is there anything that you wanted to mention, anything that you wanted to plug other than World of Do? Um, um you want to mention? Well, um, real quick, we never we didn't talk very much about the art. I know uh, a lot of people really like the game because of the art that we're using for the game. Um, it's all original woodblock prints from Japanese masters, and I got it all in my book from an amazing stroke of luck in that the Library of Congress has something like 2,600 plus high quality scans of the originals online in TIFF format for free because wow. they're hundreds of years old and they're open domain. And so, yeah, the artwork is amazing. I mean, how many other people can say, yes, I have uh, Hiroshigi and uh, Hokusai um, art in my role-playing game book? Well, I guess well, so, honor, yeah. uh, anybody that grabbed the TIFFs, I suppose. Yeah. yeah <laughs> fine, right? Okay, thanks. I, I no, actually, yeah. I, I really have to give it to the U.S. government for um, putting things up in um, uh, open, like in uh, public domain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to do uh, modern military stuff, and almost right. all of our um, photography is from the American government because everything they put up is public domain. Canadian government wants you to license it. Uh, so we just got another. Sorry, we got another question there. It's up there. Yep. Yeah. What is your favorite of the new Giddy? Hmm, that is a re uh, all. They're all my babies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's from Et Navin. Yes, from Et Navin. Uh, Et Navin. Um, I wrote each of them because they all hit a, a specific point for me. Uh, different things that I love about Japanese culture and this time period. So they're each like each one has its own like cool thing. I mean, and that's kind of, I mean, because I wrote them so that I would, you know, if I wouldn't want to play them, then I wasn't going to include it in the book. Um, so, like, the artist is super fun because you can literally create emotions in people and, like, give them things to, you know, act, make people act in certain ways. Not really make them, but, you know, push the story in a direction that you want it to happen. You know, and the doctor is a cool character. I always, um, 
trying to think of the specific. Um, there is Laura Jo Rowland wrote a whole series of the Sano Ichiro novels, which are basically noir detective novels in Tokugawa, Japan. If you haven't read them, you really should. They're really amazing. And one of the characters in there is a, a doctor who lives in a prison um, because he's using forbidden Western techniques. And he basically is Sano's, um, um, what's the term, uh, the person who looks at the dead bodies um, in a police department. Oh, uh, the coroner? Like, the coroner. He's basically Sano's coroner. Plus also the doctor character from, um, um, <laughs> oh, what are the, um, the Patrick O'Brien novels? Um, Master and Commander? Yes. And he's... He's one of the two, um, the Aubrey Marturin, Stephen Marturin, that character has always like interested me. So the Doctor Gary is, you know, inspired from those sort of things like that. The Gambler, of course, being always a perennial favorite in uh, Chambara films, you know, is there. And the Geisha, of course, is awesome because they have they're basically controlling a lot of power, but through indirect means, and that's always like fascinating me, like oh, you know, we're going to be friendly and nice and just talk, and but then that gives me all this power over you because knowledge is power, and that's a cool thing. And, I mean, I, I could go through all of them. I mean... Do you have a masseuse? Perhaps a blind masseuse? Um, there is the Ronin character, and there is a cool new uh, uh, thing I added to the game, which are called uh, Virtue Flaws. So you have your virtues, and you have one of them that is your weakness, but you can take for an extra advantage you can take a flawed virtue, and it could be perhaps the cunning um, virtue, um, which is, and one of them is uh, basically distracted, it's blind, where you, you don't notice what's going on around you. So the actual description is you can lie like an actor and you can tell what others do as well with your cunning, but you miss important details in the world around you. Perhaps you are a blind masseuse. When you try to notice what's going on, your flaw activates. So nice. basically, when you try to roll, but it's ba your flaw is you know is happening with you know that interaction, then your 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 virtue becomes basically the equivalent of your um, b basically becomes a weakness. So you can't roll it, so you lose access to it. And then there's an uh, an advantage called in another lifetime. So for a short time, you had another call, and you can gain two ranks of glory reputation and a Geary, other than your current Geary. Um, so you could, you know, perhaps have like masseuse as a background, as your other Geary, right. or something and that just gambler as the as the present Geary. Right. Exactly. So yeah. So you can basically build Zaito Ichi, right there. Very cool. Now, Wayne, I'm sorry, I don't understand uh, the Mecca from Heroic Journey Publishing smiley face. Don't know. Don't know what you're saying, dude. Don't know. I think I think he asked that during the uh, when I was talking about the artwork. So maybe Mecca from Heroic Journey is publishing. Um, maybe they're using some of that same type of art. Ah, yeah, okay. well, it could be. Uh... Yeah, because it's awesome and it should be in everything. So, <laughs> right? It's just. I mean, and the best part about it is a bunch of this art comes literally from the time period that I'm yeah. writing about. So it's you know, there's like the second picture under the art is the picture of this guy with a camera, and there's this woman in a dress, and it's basically a French woman and a French photographer taking photos. And yeah. if you've seen Last Samurai, mm -hmm. he's that guy. I mean, it, you know, not the same actor, obviously, of course, because it's <laughs> maybe from the 1800s, but it's like <laughs> that guy right there. You know, and you can play him if you want to be an artist. There you go. You're a photographer in 1800s Japan. So, yeah. And then, like, the third picture down I have, or fourth picture, I think, yeah, that's a Japanese woodblock print of Admiral Perry, the American. But the art style is so Japanese that at first you look at it and you're like, who is this Japanese guy? And then you're like, wait, no, this is Admiral Perry. That's really cool. So, yeah. Awesome. About the art. And yeah, and anything else I'm going to plug, I'm writing a stretch goal for John Wick's uh, little role-playing game. It's a little game, so it's a small, short game. It's called Wield. It's about where you play uh, sentient artifacts of great power and controlling their users. So you might be a one ring of power or a famous katana or something like that. Right. And I'm going to write right. the old yeah. Japan setting. And the, the people are basically the hit points for the item. Right, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, it sounds like you have uh, noticed this before. I've seen things on the Google. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and I, sh I should actually say correctly, John Wick and Gillian Frazier are, are, have written Wield the role-playing game together. I, I just said John, and I forgot to mention Jillian, and that's my bad. Jillian is also a full part of writing that game. 
So she helped. She and John together wrote uh, Wicked Fantasy, his last big game that he wrote, which is a retake on uh, the standard fantasy tropes in uh, role-playing games, and it's written for Pathfinder. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time, Ben. It's You're welcome. Been excellent speaking to you, and uh, again, the more I hear um, about the game, the more excited I am. Oh, and Wayne has uh, verified that he was, in fact, pimping his game. So, uh -huh. There we go. <laughs> So you know I what? I think I know someone that's writing a stretch or uh, part of that. I don't remember who it is now. Someone told me, and it's a friend of mine. Now I can't remember who. I don't know well, if it was you, Wayne, or if it was someone else. I don't remember. We're gonna have to put a link in the shock documents to Mecca, just because uh, Wayne's fired so many questions in. Um, that's, that's, right. his, that's his door prize. Um, but yeah. Congrats, Wayne. <laughs> the, the the top link is of course going to be World of Dew and uh, congratulations on the success you've had so far and you still got 11 more days so there's going to be a lot more success to be had I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do with this thank you yeah we're super excited and when you do your western game we want you back oh Absolutely. totally I think um, I'm going to look this up right now if I remember correctly um, the Library of Congress has a large selection of uh, fine prints um, in their online collection um, of Western American Western art. Oh, there yes. you go. Right? Can you <laughs> imagine that? I mean, <laughs> some of that art is A lot like, of ba bad black and white photos of people with horrible hats and mustaches. <laughs> right, right. No, I, yeah. but I was trying to, like, uh, all the paintings from, uh, like, Remington and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. If any of that stuff is available, oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... I, if I remember correctly, I think Aces and Eights used a lot of that stuff. So It's, it's hard to tell what's actually authentic because there's so much of it, and it's such a relatively simple style to duplicate. Right. So it's, it's hard to tell what's actually real and what it's just like, you know, like art that people have thrown up there, like clip art. There's tons of clip art images that almost match the style. Right. Uh, but, yeah, uh, it's it's... I don't know. If you do the Western or when you do the Western, definitely looking forward to that. <laughs> then instead of me uh, monopolizing your time, it's going to be Chris. Could be. All right. <laughs> yeah, they have a whole section on Civil War and prints and photos. So that, yeah, that, that's what, a whole what, other game. What is there, are you, not to dump too far ahead, like what sort of timeline were you, are you focusing on or is it just sort of a general Western? It's a general Western. I, I haven't gotten that far. I actually have... Um, to tell, give you a little bit more in depth, um, I actually have three games um, <laughs> that I have in my head. <laughs> um, one of them is it's I'll, I can talk about it. It's a hack of Apocalypse World. It's going to be a cybernetic cyberpunk uh, cyber world game. Okay. So it's going to basically you'll have playbooks, but one of the big differences I'm going to have is you're going to have cybernetics that your characters can have, and those are going to basically each be a move that you can add to your playbook. Now, so if you have cybernetic legs, it'll be a new move. Isn't there already... I thought there was already a cyberpunk hack for Dungeon World or Apocalypse World. I think there might be one that a guy was coming up with, but it's it's not the same... Yeah, not to say right. that you can't do another yeah. one. I was just I was thinking in my no, head. No, I'm sorry, only one per game. I'd That's like, right. Okay. Only one hack. <laughs> only one fantasy game ever. That's yeah. right. There's no other one, one, right? There's just one, right? Right, yeah, exactly. I, I don't know, actually. Um, like I System Shock or something like that. I, th I might be. There might be. Might... I don't know if it, it's published. I'm going to try Maybe. to get a game where I can publish it. and like. Yeah. It, or it might, not, might not, not have been. It might have been a Savage World, actually, that I'm thinking of, not Dungeon World. Oh, okay. Yeah, Savage Actually, World yes. has a ton of... Yeah, it was, sorry, I'm pretty sure it was a Savage World one now. Because it was just, like, within the last year or so that it kind of came okay. out. But anyways, yeah, Shane, cool. Shane and all the guys at Savage World, the Savage World stuff are, you know, going gangbusters over there. They're they're writing like crazy. Yeah. It was awesome. It's a pretty cool system. So, I, I love me some old school Deadlands. We used to play it every uh, Halloween We'd sit there and have the door open for people to come get candy, and then during the time we'd sit there with like a, a candle and a pumpkin, and my friend Eric would run uh, Deadlands for us. And literally every year it ended in a TPK, and it wasn't like he was trying that every year, but it nice. was. Yeah, yeah, very nice. So, yeah. 
So yeah, but then the other, uh, really quick, the other two games I'm, I'm working on, one I can't talk about because it's a giant IP and I'm trying to get the rights to that and I would, wow. love, I would love to I would love to get it, but I'm also, what I'm honestly looking at doing is get a couple games published so that when I, you know, present my stuff to this company, yeah, I can be like, yes, I am a publisher. <laughs> yeah, I'm Bob. <laughs> I, I, I've never done anything, and I'd like to get my give hands on your multi-million dollar IP. Yes, please. Give, give me the X-Men. I'd like to write a game, please. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's you know, maybe I'm... not as big as the X-Men, but it's a, <laughs> it's a popular geek, uh, definitely cool thing. I, I'm not going to say skull, anything about that. Skull kickers? No. No? no. 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 I can no. either confirm or dem- deny. <laughs> All right. And then, there, and then my last one is some demigod. There's a demigod role-playing game that I'm looking at. Hey, Wayne, right. shut up. Stop asking questions. Pay attention. <laughs> yeah, Wayne, if you weren't so busy asking questions, you would have already known that we were talking about Westerns. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. Fuck. That fucking Wayne. No Jeez, Wayne. No, yeah, Wayne, I'm, I'm looking at porting over basic concepts from A World of Dew into a Western role-playing game. So, yeah. Th- that you awesome will be Western able art. to support through Kickstarter next year. Next year, right? <laughs> next year, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah. No. Um. Honestly, it really depends upon my life schedule. I have a day job. I run it. You know, I'm the manager for a family. Yeah. Family jewelry store. I've been doing that for ten years with my dad, and then oh, cool. I have kids and all sorts of other stuff like that. I, so, I always find it interesting the walks in life that people in our hobby come from. Yeah. Right. Like you got a lot of like computer guys, art guys. You're the first guy running a jewelry store I've, that I've run across. Yeah, I was uh, pre-law, and then I met a girl, and that didn't happen. And then uh, my da- and then I was teaching for a while, and then my which is what my mom did. And then uh, my dad was like, "Hey, I'm doing this, and I'm going to offer you this much, and it's paid a lot better than uh, teaching, and doesn't take all the hours." <laughs> and I love teaching. Don't get me wrong; it was super rewarding. It was just also uh, rewarding in a non-monetary sense. Yeah, so, right. right. Yeah. No, I totally hear you. Yeah, so uh, I did, I've been doing that for 10 years, and literally like 10 years, and uh, it's super fun. I have a great time. My dad's an awesome boss, so yeah, that's, yeah, so that I do that, and then I'm also on the board for uh, our local community theater, so yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm not unbusy. My, <laughs> my friends say that I don't actually sleep. I, I just, uh, I just am working on something else, even when I'm sleeping, supposedly. So. <laughs> You're just, I'm not sleeping, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about something else. I'm thinking with my eyes shut. Yeah. I do that a lot. I watch a lot of TV with my eyes shut. Right? Yeah. 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 My wife and I, we both do that a lot. Ever hey, we watched that last episode of Castle. Do you remember what happened? No. Yeah. Nope. nope. <laughs> we I'm were both there. I'm watching that. Yeah. Don't I'm turn that off. I'm watching that. Ten yeah. minutes into it. Nah. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually... Uh, Watching, um, uh, yeah, it was Hidden Fortress. Actually, it was super late when I was watching Hidden Fortress, and I was, you know, I was really enjoying it. And then for about maybe thirty minutes into it, I started like nodding off. I'm like, oh no, 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 I'm not falling asleep for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I got up and I went and got a bunch of caffeine, and <laughs> that's when I injected myself with pure adrenaline. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I was getting too much blood in my caffeine system. So. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, unfortunately, I think we're going to call this a night. Yeah. Um, again, thanks so much, Ben. And You're listen, anytime you want to chat about uh, Chanbara, Samurai movies, and Kirikou, all this stuff like that, maybe after um, the World of Dew hits, uh, you let sure. us know. And you're, you're totally welcome back here. Love to chat with you more. That'd be awesome. great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, hey, last uh, thing real quick. I will be at Gen Con. So this is something I just thought of. So if any Canadians who hate the shipping happen to also have way more money and want to just, you know, go to Gen Con, or if you just are going to Gen Con already, I will be in, at Gen Con. So that is a possibility where I may, you know, I will hold your book for you at Gen Con and I can hand it to you there. Are you going to have, uh, yeah. I Knock on wood if I have the copies. I'm not, I'm not sure if Gen Con's happening or not this year. There's a, a driveway that I need to replace. So <laughs> Driveway, my way. Kind of <laughs> dipping into the <laughs> recreational funds. I understand. So, are you going to have? Speaking of Gen Con, are you going to have for people that didn't back it at the Kickstarter print copies available? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, well, okay. Again, knock on wood. Well, if, if everything... The, yeah, falls. if everything happens as, as we hope, then we should have the print copies out before Gen Con. We should be mailing them, and then in the backer uh, survey that everyone's going to get, I'll ask you if you want a copy mailed to you or if you want to receive it at Gen Con. And then we can have that. So you can pick it up at Gen Con if you want. I, so I meant like extra copies, like outside of oh, the Oh, yes. Computer. Yes. <laughs> I will be print, we, are, we are printing extra copies because the game has done so well. Uh, we are definitely going to have extra copies. I'm going to be at the IGDN booth. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a whole yeah. group of us, and I'm going to be running games Friday and Saturday. I think I'm going to be running four games. So I was originally going to run six, and then we had space issues, and so I gave up a couple games because I was running way more than everyone else. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll run four. And you know, maybe see this <laughs> I've actually never actually gone to. So this will be it's my really first time. It's on. it's really cool. It's, it's awesome. Uh, it's it'll be interesting, right? Because you're you're there as a not as a an, an end user as you will. So you've right. got responsibilities and your time's already kind of filled up. Yeah. But as just a, a goer, like I, you can walk the halls for the whole weekend and and never really see the same thing twice. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. No. It's I, really cool. I, it's like it's like I've been to San Diego Comic Con, and I'm actually uh, in two weeks. We're going to be Phoenix Comic Con. And okay. I'm going to be running stuff at Phoenix Comic Con, but I've gone to both of those as like just a user. And you're totally right; they're huge, these huge, huge events, and you, you know walk back the same place, and it's still different. So yeah, yeah, uh, well, yeah. I I just remember our last visit to Gen Con where our buddy Corey Reed was um, releasing uh, his uh, comic book. And uh, the difference on his face between the first day and the last day of Gen Con was <laughs> dramatic. Yeah, that was probably the, that was probably the influenza or whatever plague he had too. But <laughs> he had the and con I, crud. And, and uh. you mentioned the the Canadian in um, IGDN. I'm just wondering if it's not Jason uh, Jason Petrie because um, yes. I know that again the year that we were there, he was selling a bunch of stuff at that booth as well, and he's going to have post human pathways. Which yes. I, if if he's going to be at Gen Con, he'll probably have those. And by the way, Wayne, you will not see a zombie ninja dinosaur port. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, actually, don't say that. If oh. I hit fifty thousand dollars, then I might consider doing a zombie ninja dinosaur port. How much? Fifty thousand. If we hit fifty thousand. All right, Wayne, pony up. Yeah, we'll <laughs> get out there, thirty-five thousand, bitch. <laughs> Show the love. I will never say no to someone's suggestion. Wayne's Wayne's you know, there might the be arm. a high price point, but yeah. Wayne's ex-military. He's got tons of money. He's got shitloads of money. And he knows that. You know how well they're paid. Well, and they got all the cocaine deals running. I've seen the movies. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, you do. Say yeah. hi. 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 We're just about finishing. This is my little dude. This is hey, Will. Little dude. Yeah. He he looks a lot bigger. He's actually only three, even though if you could see fully, he's he's like the size of a five-year-old. It's not that we're taller. <laughs> so Godzilla DNA in there somewhere. Something like that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's the German super tall, crazy people sort of thing. You know that we've got going on. I've got you know let's see, I've got German and then German and German and then some more German and some more German, a little bit of Swedish, and that's basically my family background. So yeah. Do you want to say hi? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hi. Hi. How hi. you doing? Good. Good. That's good to hear. What is it? Bedtime? Um, almost. Almost. Yeah. Are Same you going to get a story before bedtime? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What kind of story do you want? It's like we live in we we live in this desert. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Lots of sand. Yep. Is yeah. it hot? No, not hot. The, po the pool is warm. Oh, <laughs> warm. Okay, that's nice. I like warm. Yeah. Me too, but it's not warm. My teeth are chattering. Teeth are chattering, yeah. We're from we're in Canada. Does we're my very mommy very... know that I'm too cold in cold water. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> we're used to that because we're from Canada. Can we go out of? Can we go out of the pool? That that's a good time to get out of the pool. Yeah, that is smart. You are a smart kid. 
Yeah, when we get out of the pool, it's when the polar bears show up. Um, no polar bears show up. Just well, come on you... to Grandma Jody's. She lives. She lives in Maui Lane, and we live in Maui Lane. <laughs> well, so very close. That's good. It's excellent. Yeah. Do so you visit a lot? Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Right. Sounds like you've got a good life, kid. Then we uh, nope. then we um Are you telling them all about your day? My day was we went swimming. Oh. Momo and mommy um, went swimming with me. I wish I had that kind of day. <laughs> yeah, really. That is a great day. No kidding. You are a lucky guy. Do you you think don't you are... go swimming? Not, Not today. No. Got to work. You know how your daddy so, goes to work every day? Yeah. Yeah, we do too. We, I go to preschool. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who's your I've, best friend at preschool? Kaylee. Kaylee? Yeah. Kaylee, Kaylee turned free today. Oh, very oh, cool. Oh, happy birthday, Kaylee. I... Did you sing happy birthday to her? <laughs> um, it's at the birthday. Yeah? I think her birthday was a couple weeks ago. Yeah. It was okay. a couple weeks ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> Today, a couple weeks ago, it's all the same. It's it's kid time. <laughs> That's right. It's like there's, there's before, right now, or all um, other times. We just... Had to do it. Yet, mommy chose that we had to do it. Do what? Oh, okay. Go swimming. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, we're back to swimming. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, well, I think I think we're gonna I think we're gonna go to bed now. <laughs> it's yeah. You do you don't understand about time zones yet, but when you do, it's much later for us. Oh, uh, I didn't know. Yeah. yeah, sorry, buddy. <laughs> what was the question? I didn't know. Can you can you ask your daddy? Say, daddy, what are time Did zones? Daddy, mm -hmm. what do what do time what zones? Time zones mean? Oh, hold on. Let me ask. Let me. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> we, were, we were just we were trying to explain time zones. Oh, wow. time zones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, yeah. te we then we told him to ask you about birds and bees. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, here I'll explain you, Will, really quickly. You know when we go to Grandpa Gill's house in North Carolina? Yeah. Yeah, and how it's super late when we get there. Yeah. They live in a time zone that's very similar, but they live farther north than we do. So it's later in the day for them where it is than it is for us right now. And that's why we have polar bears. That's right. <laughs> and that's why you have polar bears. Right. That's, they live far that's, why, that's why we have to get out of the swimming pool. <laughs> right. Of course. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we are. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, too. And, uh, uh, well, so we'll uh, close this up. Good night from Fraser. Good night from Chris. Good night from Ben. And Will. Can your son say good night? Yeah. Get Will say good night. Here, here, Will. Say good night real quick. Good night. Can you say it in there? Good night. Good night, Will. Good night, Will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks All right. a lot, man. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. All right. Good night.